Okay, so first of all, I'd like to thank all the organizers for putting on this workshop and also for inviting a poor cosmologist like myself to speak. So I'll be speaking as a cosmologist to an audience which is a formal field theorist and string theorist. So I will first of all give you a motivation for why cosmologists look for a, a universe scenario which has to go beyond effective field theory. So I'll be trying to persuade all of you that we simply cannot study the early universe using effective field theory techniques. So that's going to be the motivational part of the talk. And then I will switch to the attempts that we've undertaken to try to do something that goes beyond effective point particle theory. I'll be talking about a space-time background, which we are trying to construct from the BFSS matrix model. And then I'll talk, I'll give part one of a computation of fluctuations from this matrix theory cosmology. Fluctuations, these are energy density fluctuations, microwave background anisotropies, things that we can observe. And this is part one. Part two of this will be given this afternoon by Schudorf, and then I'll close with some speculations. Now, here I have archive numbers of three research papers, and these are all in collaboration with Schudorf Brahma and Samuel Laliberté, both of whom are going to speak this afternoon. And uh, here, there's a review article. Now, if you look at the dates, you will see that this is 2001, 2021, 2022, but not 2023. So in a certain sense, I am here to get also some feedback and inspiration to push this program forward. Okay, so let me start with uh, the motivation. So in cosmology, we have data. And for, for example, we have data on anisotropies of the cosmic microwave background. So a plot, which I'm sure all of you have seen, is the following plot, EMB anisotropies. So you plot the strength of anisotropies so this is strength of anisotropies on angular scales. You label them by angular quantum number L. And uh, the, the data is, uh, has these interesting features. So this is amplitude of anisotropies, and this is inverse angular scale, large angular scales, small angular scales. And this angular scale corresponds to about one degree in the sky. So this is the data, beautiful data. And uh, now the first physical understanding of the origin of this data predates inflation by about 10 years. So there are two famous papers by Zunyayev and Zeldovic. And by Peebles and you, from approximately 1970. This is about 10 years before the development of inflation. And if you look at this paper by, Zel by Zunyaev and Zeldovic, you see the following sketch. So in this sketch, here you see time, and here you see space. And the spatial coordinates are co-moving coordinates. They are coordinates which expand as the universe expands. So this plot, space-time sketches in the context of standard Big Bang cosmology, where there's the Big Bang. And then there's a time of recombination. And this is a time when the microwave background is released. So This is the standard Big Bang horizon. And but Zeldovic and Zunyaev, people say you argued is the following way, is the following. Let us assume 
that there was some mechanism in the early universe which produces density waves on different angular scales. Okay. So these are density fluctuations on different angular scales, K1, K2. Now, if you study the evolution of density perturbations in the universe, then you find that if the wavelength is larger than the horizon, concretely the Hubble radius, then the fluctuations are frozen in. But when the wavelength drops below the Hubble radius horizon, then they start to oscillate. So the assumption that Zelovich and Zunia have made, here are the assumptions. The assumption is a large, approximately homogeneous universe, which is approximately spatially flat. And there's some source of fluctuations. So you see these assumptions that represents this sketch, which I drew. So then the fluctuations, they are standing waves until they enter the Hubble radius, and then they start to oscillate. So let us now look, do another diagram. I will now have, again, time, and I will have space. And we are observing the microwave background. So we are sitting here today, and we are looking at the past light rays. And if you have a density perturbation, so this is the surface of constant density, constant temperature, the photons are emitted at different times with the same temperature, and therefore they are received with different temperatures today. So this sketch shows that a delta rho initially leads you to temperature fluctuations. So this is the origin of these temperature fluctuations, which are seen here. OK, so this scale here enters the horizon right at recombination. We catch it at maximal amplitude. It does not have time to oscillate. So this scale here is precisely this peak. Now, this scale here has had time to do a quarter of an oscillation. We catch it even density. Uh, with a velocity perturbation, this is this scale here. Okay, so, so bottom line is that if you have any early universe scenario which satisfies these criteria, then you will be reproducing this plot. In fact, microwave anisotropies were discovered 20 years after Zeldovich and Zunyaev and people and you understood this physics. So now I want to give you the criteria for a successful early universe cosmology. So the first criterion is that you need to have an a large and approximately spatially flat universe. So concretely, what you need is you need the horizon, which is the region of causal influence. You need this to be much, much larger than the Hubble radius. Let me introduce the Hubble radius. If we have a universe, with the usual Friedman-Robertson-Walker metric. 
and the Hubble radius is the inverse of the expansion rate. The local concept. Okay. So what this means is that at recombination, the causal horizon has to be much bigger than this. This is the first criterion. Now the second criterion, which is also not satisfied in standard Big Bang cosmology, is that you need to have a physical mechanism to produce these waves, these initial density perturbations. And in order to be able to produce density perturbations using causal physics, you can only do that if the length scale is smaller than the Hubble radius. So in the very early universe, You need the physical length, band of T, to be smaller than LH. This is the physical length. Of fluctuations which are being observed. That's a physical length associated with these fluctuations. And thirdly, you need to produce a rough scale invariance of the fluctuations. These are the three criteria. And I will move this all the way up, this all the way down. So these are the criteria. And now I'll present you three scenarios in which these three criteria are satisfied. Scenario one. And scenario one is inflation. So let me draw a space time diagram of inflation. You have time. We are here today. T zero. This is today. Um, in inflationary scenario, you assume that there is a period of finite duration when space expands exponentially or almost exponentially. So let me first draw the horizon. That's the region of causal contact. So this will be space. So the horizon grows linearly until the onset of inflation. Once space grows exponentially, the horizon will grow exponentially. And then after the end of inflation, the horizon will grow linearly again. So this is the horizon. Now, what does the Hubble radius do? Well, the Hubble radius is the inverse expansion rate, so the Hubble radius is constant during inflation. And then it goes linearly. So, you, because of the exponential expansion of space, there's an exponential difference between horizon and Hubble radius, and therefore the first criterion is satisfied. Now, if we take are length scales that are being observed today. So this is a particular length scale which we are observing today. We trace it back. In standard Big Bang cosmology, it is outside of the Hubble radius at all times, but during the period of inflation, the physical length associated with this fluctuation expands exponentially. So if the period of inflation lasts long enough, criterion two is satisfied. Now, if the, if the accelerated expansion is almost exponential, then the energy density during this phase is almost constant. And that means that whatever demon produces fluctuations during the inflationary phase will produce the fluctuations 
on different length scales with the same amplitude. This is the scale invariance of the fluctuations. So this is scenario one, but it is not the only scenario. Scenario two, this is a bounce in cosmology. So here what we assume is that as a function of time, the scale factor of the universe bounces, contracting phase, then expanding phase. And if I take this, if I draw the space time diagram, this is zero, time and space. I now use my co-moving coordinates, which expand as space expands. Then what happens at the Hubble radius evolves like this. Hubble radius. The horizon is infinite because time runs from minus infinity to plus infinity. So criterion one satisfied. Let's look at fluctuation modes on some co-moving coordinates. They start out sub-Hubble. The criterion two satisfied. And now in the same way that there are classes of accelerating models in which you get the scale invariant spectrum, there are classes of contracting scenarios where you also get scale invariant spectra. So in general, you don't always get scale invariant spectra, but there are special classes, yes. No, you don't. You, see, what I drew here is what, from the point of view of effective field theory, from the point of view of effective field theory, you could have this. From the point of view of effective field theory. But since you asked this question, clearly, in order to get this, we need to go beyond EFT. Now, the third scenario is an emergent cosmology. This is going to be important for this talk. And it, the timeline for the emergent cosmology is the following. Time, scale factor, usual standard Big Bang expansion, And something here, which is the emergent phase, which I will plot as constant scale factor. This is the emergent phase. Okay, this is going to be the matrix model phase. Okay, so this is the time, the scale factor evolution as a function of time in the emergent cosmology and what you get as a space-time diagram, this is, again, co-moving coordinates, Hubble radius does this. This is H inverse. These are my scales. So you see the horizon is infinite. Fluctuations start sub-Hubble. And it turns out that if you have thermal fluctuations with holographic scaling in this phase, thermal fluctuations with holographic scaling, then you get scaling invariants of fluctuations. And I'll demonstrate this. OK, so the bottom line is that there is more than just one scenario that can explain the data. Now, clearly, here we have to go beyond an effective field theory. So now what I want to do is I want to, yeah. It will be a non-geometric phase in what I'll present. 
Okay, so now I want to uh, try to convince you that even if we want to implement scenario one, we need to go beyond effective field theory. So I want to convince you that this scenario is unrealizable in the context of effective field theory. Now, for those of you who are based in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, this is obviously a very controversial claim that I'm making. And uh, this is related to the transplantian censorship point. So you see, I was an undergraduate in Europe. So therefore, I know how to use this equipment. In fact, when I was an undergraduate, then it's not the professor who had to do this, but it's always the students who, who, had, who had to do this. In a certain sense, I would need an assistant here. Okay. So oh, let's go back to this space-time diagram of inflation. So you see, from this space-time diagram of, inf of inflation, You see, as like Jérôme Martin and myself argued in approximately 2000, we are that if the duration of inflation is long, then at the beginning of inflation, the wavelengths of fluctuations that we observe today Pi is the beginning of inflation, is smaller than L prime or L star. And so, therefore, clearly, effective field theory breaks down. So, this is the argument that you immediately see from this diagram. And so, what Bedroya and Waffer are postulated is that this setup can never happen. So they argue that there's a principle which says that if you start with the Planck length at some initial time, EI, and you evolve to any later time, so the wavelength expands proportional to the scale factor, then you have to remain smaller than the Hubble radius at that later time. This is a transplant in censorship principle. Okay, and if you apply it to inflation, you find the following. So you find that if you want to accommodate a sufficiently long period of inflation that renders scales that we observe today to be inside of the Hubble radius at early times, you have to move out this Hubble radius to a large distance, which means you need a low scale of inflation. You need the scale of inflation to be less than about 3 times 10 to the 9 GeV, which is about five orders of magnitude smaller than what you have in usual inflationary models. And this implies that if you want to get fluctuations from inflation, you need extreme fine tuning. 
Okay, so this is the TCC. And now um, when I give the talk uh, with transparencies, then I usually have more time because it obviously takes longer to write on the board. And there are three justifications for this Franz Planck in censorship conjecture. They are independent of string theory. So justification one, is um, Penrose's cosmic censorship hypothesis. Translated from black holes to cosmology. The second one is unitarity violation. So if you have an effective field theory, then what you're doing is you're taking all modes, Fourier modes in co-moving coordinates, and you're quantizing each Fourier mode as a harmonic oscillator. So you need a UV cutoff at a fixed physical scale, not co-moving scale. And to maintain this fixed physical ultraviolet cutoff, you need to continuously create modes, which is extreme violation of unitarity. And there's a former UBC professor, Nathan Weiss, who actually wrote a paper in 1985 discussing this. So if you want the unitarity violation to be hidden from observables, if you demand that the inevitable unitarity violation is hidden from observables, you get exactly this criterion. And the third justification is if you want the entanglement entropy density, which builds between super and sub Hubble modes, which builds up to inflation. If you want this to be smaller than the thermal entropy after inflation, then you again get up to factor of water unity, you get this kind. So if you want to get inflation using effective field theory techniques without fine tuning, you are violating the second law of thermodynamics that you're doing a non-unitary uh, analysis. Okay, so therefore, independent of which all universe scenario you want, you have to go beyond effective field theory. Now, most of you are string theorists. And so obviously what you would like to do is you would like to make a prediction for observables from string theory. So what we're going to do now is, so I'm going to start with the EFSS matrix model, which is a proposed non-perturbative definition of string theory. And uh, I'm going to see how far I get, how far we get. And I'll come to this. Let me mention something else. And this is something which I guess Harold already mentioned in his talk. That uh, if we have a non productive approach to cosmology, then the cosmological constant problem takes on a completely different light. So if we do effective field theory, if we quantize each harmonic oscillator, each harmonic oscillator has a ground state energy. And therefore, there is the quantum aspect of the cosmological constant problem. So if we start with a non-perturbative definition, quantum definition, we never quantize harmonic oscillators. 
and then it is very possible that we will have no cosmological constant. And you will see that we claim that in this matrix Earth theory background, there is no cosmological constant. So now turn to here. But so I think you all have seen the Lagrangian for the BFSS matrix model, so I do not need to write it down. So we start with the BFSS action. And this involves nine Hermitian n by n matrices. I should mention that we are always in the Minkowski signature, not Euclidean. And then there's a tenth matrix A0, which appears in the covariant derivative. So altogether we have 10 matrices. So this is our starting point. Now we consider a thermal state of this model, temperature T. And we choose the temperature so high in order that the BFSS action is dominated by the Matsubara zero mode. So we can ex expand each of these matrices. So the temperature is so high that it is the n equals zero modes which dominate and the n not equal to zero modes are subdominant. Now the idea is that we will use these n equals zero modes to give us the background cosmology and these modes will give us the fluctuations. Oh, so concretely, we need, we need to take, we choose the temperature so high that this term is smaller than this term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, I don't think we'll be able to construct a nice background. Yeah. No, probably not. Okay, uh, that's a good, actually, I'd have to go back. I don't, Judah, do you have a good answer to that? It's not necessary. It can, it can be sub substring scale. Okay. You mean, you mean here? Or from ah, background is bosons only. Only. Anti yeah, it will be anti-periodic, yeah. right? But since the uh, well, so th this will come into the computation of the fluctuations, and I think whether it's periodic or anti-periodic, just for the fluctuations, the holographic scaling will be unchanged. Okay, so now since I won't get to where I wanted to get, let me just mention that these are thermal fluctuations, and these are thermal fluctuations of things that involve strings. And therefore, string theory is holographic. These will automatically be fluctuations which have holographic scaling. Okay, so. Yes. So, specifically, what I mean is that the specific heat capacity in a region of radius r, that will go as r square and not r cubed. We, we, are, getting, we are going to get only three large dimensions. So just to put this in perspective. Okay, so now the way that we construct the background is very similar to what you presented. So we uh, take, a, so I should mention that the S naught action is the action of the IKKT model. 
So therefore, we can construct the space-time diagram exactly as you told us how to do. So we diagonalize A0, and the diagonal elements become time. This is time. And we can show using the properties of uh, trace A0 square, the properties that you've determined in your simulations, we can show that in the n going to infinity limit, we get continuous infinite time. And time ranges from minus infinity to plus infinity. So we see something which looks a little bit like scenario three. Now, the way that we will get space is the following. We will take the xi matrices, i from one to n. These are not diagonal. But it turns out that the off diagonal elements, the k, if n is, uh, um, so we, are, we want to define space at a particular time. Okay, so we, this is the time. We go down the spatial diagonals to this position of time, and then we take a subblock of size ni, i n i, here subblocks. So these ni's are going to be our co-moving coordinates. And what Jun discussed as extent of space parameters, we will call that the physical length of a curve from n equals zero to n i. This will be the expectation value of trace uh, x i square tilde square n i t. These are these sub matrices x i tilde of n i and t. So this is the definition of physical length. And once we have our definition of physical length, we can immediately obtain the GII components of a metric at coordinate ni at time t. We essentially just take the derivative of this. So it's usual general relativity. You have the length, you have co-moving coordinates that gives us uh, the metric. You get the GII components. And what you find is that the GII components, and I of T, that they are independent of NI. For I equals one, two, three. Only we now use the evidence that you've provided that three, only three out of the nine extent of space parameters become large. Okay, and at late times, we can solve the classical equations and then we find power law evolution of A of T. Now you use the remaining SO3 symmetry to get this. And what this gives you is a spatially flat metric. Okay, so with this prescription, you can construct a background space time from the matrix model. You can construct um, the spatial part of the metric, and you find that it's spatially flat, and you find that it's spatially flat for ni smaller than some n sub c, which scales as square root of n, which goes to infinity as n goes to infinity. So what you're getting is you're getting infinite space that emerges, and it is spatially flat. At least it is spatially flat to a distance that scales to infinity.
Okay, so, so you, this is our starting point. And I'm not a string theorist, but I heard people proposing the BFSS model as a non perturbative definition of superstring theory. So basically, let's start with that. And okay, in standard Big Bang cosmology, we start in a thermal state. So, yes. We, and you'll hear this afternoon a talk which is based on IKKT. So, you think they're equivalent? No, they're not completely equivalent. We, yeah, so, so, so the is a point. Yes. What? We'll hear about that this afternoon. Right. Yes. Right. No. no. Which which is correct? I'm not going. To, I'm not going to answer that. But what I will what I will do is the following. And uh, we are computing the fluctuations, and we make predictions from the BFSS for the fluctuations amplitude and tilts, and then though the, the tilts might differ between the two, we compare with observations. We, we would do it that way. Now, I'm out of time, you see? So, um, Tura will tell you how exactly scaling variant fluctuations arise from, from this matrix model. And I will end with some speculations because I do need some feedback. So give me two minutes. Okay. Now the thing that I'm that I'm um, putting in by hand here is these the fact that only three of these extensive space parameters are becoming large. And this is the thing the next thing that we would like to understand. So now I will put forward a conjecture. And I will not write this down on the board because this is a conjecture. So this is a speculation. So some of you probably remember that in 1989, Waffa and myself proposed string gas cosmology, which is a toy model based on ideas of string theory, which realizes this emergent scenario. In that picture, we had a clear mechanism for why only three dimensions became large. And this was the fact that all dimensions are wound by strings, winding strings. And in order to get space to expand, you have to get rid of the winding modes. For that, you need the string world sheets to intersect. This doesn't happen in more than three large spatial dimensions. So my conjecture is that this mechanism can be embedded in matrix theory. And the way that it will be embedded in matrix theory is that the strings are solitons tonic excitations of the matrices. So if we can show that, if we can construct these solitons, if we can show that they are stable, if we can show that parallel solitons do not have any interactions, at that point, we will be able to use the intuition, the free energy calculations that we did in string gas cosmology, they will directly translate to matrix model, and we will then have a clear physical understanding for why only three of the extent of space parameters become large. So this is what we are trying to do. And if you think this is crazy, please talk to me uh, afterwards. So thanks for giving me a couple of extra minutes. <laughs>